Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Halloween. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the introducer this morning, who's Dr. Tressie Shaw. So for those of you who are uh, residents and don't know, Tressie Shaw has two uh, uh, contributions to Phoenix Children's that have gone on for, what, now over 15 years and will last for a long time. But she founded the Special Needs Clinic here, which is now run by Dr. Uh, Wendy Bernatovich, and she founded Palliative Care and became the first pediatric palliative care doctor that we have here. And with, without further ado, I'm going to have her introduce our, our guest speakers. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is my absolute delight and privilege and pleasure to introduce Blythe Lord today. So Blythe received her BA in history from Yale College and a master's from Harvard University. Um, she founded the Courageous Parents Network in 2014, 13 years after her daughter and her nephew died from infantile Tay-Sachs. And I think I... I really just am so, um, it's such a treat to have her here with us to share her knowledge and all the things that she's been working on with Courageous Parents Network, which really brings a voice um, to the lived experience of children and families with serious illness. Um, she has been a tireless advocate um, and worked with leaders in the field um, on this and sharing all of these resources with the various members of the healthcare team. Um, Last year, um, or rather, I guess a couple of years ago, because it's 2021, she received the Presidential Citation for Palliative Care and Advocacy from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, which is a wonderfully prestigious award. Um, and um, she is also the liaison both for the American Academy of Pediatrics section on Hospice and Palliative Medicine and the AHPM. Um, and so it is our absolute and delight and privilege to have her with us here today. Um, Blythe, please um, take it away. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you very, very much, Jesse. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, it's great to be with all of you. Um, it had been my uh, hope in the early days that I could come in person because I've never been in person to, um, to Phoenix Children's Hospital. Well, I've never been in person to Phoenix, period. So I was really hopeful to be there in person, but that was not to be. So at some point, uh, hopefully that will happen. Um, John, is it working now? Are you guys seeing my full screen? Yes. Well, uh, yes. Okay. So how this is going to go is I have a slides um, and then at there, I will stop sharing in order for John to play some of the videos that are from Courageous Parents Network because we tested and the videos play better when um, they play from Phoenix rather than off my laptop. So there will be a moment of a transition, but for now I'm in the driver's seat and here to talk to you um, about what we at CPN call um, fostering the good, which will make sense in a moment, uh, accompanying parents of children living with serious medical conditions. Uh, the objectives for this session are that uh, participants will learn about parents' inner experiences and barriers to agency in the context of serious pediatric illness and medical complexity, reflect on your role in fostering parental agency and good parent beliefs, and hopefully feel better equipped to accompany families and honor their journey. So this is a very recent photo taken 10 days ago in uh, the Boston area. You can see me there with the gray hair uh, in the sitting in the front with nine other women, sadly all women. Um, they are all parents who are actively caring or have cared for children living with serious medical conditions. They came together at our invitation selected by us to become part of our new parent champion program. We have um, Courageous Parents Network is at its core, a advocacy organization of by parents for parents with our core value being the value of palliative care to support and accompany families of children living with serious illness. And People, the primary 
speakers and representatives have been myself and another parent, as well as all of the content on the website, which we will look at in a moment. But in order to scale and really take our message more broad, we are training parents from different parts of the country with different lived experiences to advocate for the value of palliative care, the lived experience of families, and as well as advocate for, for or promote Courageous Parents Network as a resource to help families and as a resource to help clinicians help families. And I share this with you because there is, it is a physical manifestation in person of what CPN has been doing digitally on the platform since we were founded in 2014. This is a picture of uh, all of those moms with their families. I'm up there in the upper right with my daughter, Cameron, but the other parents are featured here with their children. The girl in the middle, that's um, Lauren Graver. <coughs> her daughter, her mother, Amy, was in the previous picture. I decided just to feature Lauren there in her courageous battle, um, although I don't love the battle terminology, in her courageous journey with cancer. Um, that um, ultimately she died a few years ago. I just, I love this collection um, because these are, this is a snapshot of the families that are, This is, these families represent the families that you see at Phoenix Children that are being cared for all over the country that are living at home, um, in their homes, being tended to by their parents who are inpatient in hospitals being tended to by um, inpatient teams. This is just a snapshot of that. So when we the champions came together, we asked each of the parents, um, and by the way, we recruited parents from around the country. It we wish some fathers had um, you know applied for the position, but it was in the, at least thus far it was only mothers. Um, the, we asked each of them to say, why do they advocate for pediatric palliative care? And to put that into six words. And I'm not gonna tell you what their, their all of their six words were. We're rolling this program out over the course of the next few weeks. If you follow us on social, you will learn them. But my six words were, because palliative care helps parents be parents. And I do need to say that when I'm talking about palliative care, I'm not talking about the specialty of palliative care. I'm talking about primary palliative care, palliative informed care, palliative minded care, the palliative care that we at CPN believe, as does Tressie, as does the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine and the American Academy of Pediatrics believe is all clinicians can practice palliative informed care. And we're going to talk about what we mean by that. And that is what I mean here when I say palliative care helps palliative, helps parents be parents. Because palliative care helps parents feel that they are being good parents to their child that is sick and to their other children. What do we mean by that? All of this began for me in 2000, oh, in, I should say, 1999, when my daughter Cameron, there on the left, was diagnosed with infantile Tay-Sachs. She was diagnosed at six months of age, which is very young, because her first cousin, my husband's nephew, was diagnosed two weeks prior with infantile Tay-Sachs after first being diagnosed erroneously with cerebral palsy. He, his father, Tim, is my husband's identical twin who married my roommate from college. So we were very, we were four parents, very tight. Hayden was their first child. They don't fall into the at-risk population. So when he presented at the age of one, failing to hit developmental milestones, they said, they said, okay, he must have cerebral palsy. At that point, my daughter Cameron was born. Fast forward five months later, Cameron has just been given a glowing bill of health from her primary care pediatrician, um, who Tressie knows. And But at that moment, her um, cousin, Hayden, now 18 months old, 
was accurately diagnosed as having infantile Tay-Sachs because he was regressing in his skills, at which point they concluded it was not cerebral palsy. He was seen by an ophthalmologist who saw the cherry red spots. I went online. I learned that both parents have to be carriers. I knew that my gr maternal paternal grandmother was of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, which meant it was entirely possible that I was a carrier. I assumed my husband was a carrier because he's an identical twin. And another point um, that's important is that online, it said that one of the only early signs of Tay-Sachs is that the babies don't outgrow their startle response. And my daughter, Cameron, who was my second daughter, so I had seen how my older daughter had outgrown the startle was still startling. And it was at that point that I went in, I got tested, I came back as a carrier. The geneticist, geneticist said, it is so statistically improbable that all four of you would be carriers. Let's have Cameron tested. They did the blood enzyme test, the assay test, came back that she had almost no hex A, which is one of, which is the primary indicator that um, the child has uh, Tay-Sachs. So within two weeks, we had learned that our two beautiful children, my daughter and my nephew, would die in early childhood. At that time, 1999, and still today, there is no effective treatment for Tay-Sachs. So at that point, it was palliative care only. Now, it's important to know palliative care was not a specialty. For pediatric palliative care was not a specialty in that, at that time. And all of the palliative care that our family received was from her primary care pediatrician who practiced anticipatory guidance, had conversations about goals of care, what we wanted, um, and then did advanced care planning with us, and we'll get to this in a moment, supported us at Cameron's end of life. The photo in the middle is me with Cameron a month after her diagnosis. I share this photo because I think you can see, and I certainly remember feeling the sadness that I had looking at this precious, perfect looking creature, my child, knowing that she would not be with us within a few years and that there wasn't anything that I could do to change that outcome. I am unbelievably sad in that photo. The photo on the right is me four days before Cameron died. I did not know that it was four days before she died. It is her second birthday. We are about to have a kick-ass garden party in the backyard. That is my husband, Charlie, and me with our older daughter, Taylor, on my lap. And then our newborn Eliza, who looks like a little bug, who at the time was 10 weeks old, and Cameron on Charlie's lap. I am not overwhelmed with grief and sadness in that photo. I have accepted what is coming. At this point, Hayden has died. My husband was present at his nephew's end of life. He has told me what end of life can look like. I have seen my brother and sister-in-law and I have seen that they are still going. I have been working with a grief counselor. I have been receiving palliative care through her pediatrician. My husband and I have talked about what matters most to us. We know what we want for Cameron. I am as confident and equipped as a parent can be to do right for my daughter, which begins the next day when her pediatrician diagnoses her as having pneumonia. We did not know in that moment that she had in that moment another pneumonia. And we opted in after multiple pneumonias, which we treated, we opted not to treat that last pneumonia. And she died peacefully at home four days later, but I'm getting ahead of myself. These are some more parents in the Courageous Parents Network community. Some of these children are in the hospital. Some of these children are at home. All of these children are loved 
passionately with extraordinary devotion by their parent or parents. When I was starting Courageous Parents Network and I were a nonprofit, I was raising money to get started. And one of the funders who I was hoping to get a gift from said, well, what is the evidence of the importance of what you're trying to do? Why does the work that you're trying, that Courageous Parents Network is doing, why does it matter other than a nice to have? What makes it a need to have? At first, I was flummoxed and extremely annoyed by his question. Um, but then I was like, okay, fair enough. I'm going to go back and do some research. There was very, very little research at the time about the societal impact of a lack of support for families of children, for parents and siblings and families generally. There was lots of um, evidence about, you know, symptom management, treatment management, but not about the psychosocial and emotional burden and impact on families caring for children living with illness. Except I did come upon the research of Dr. Pamela Hines. She's a nurse at Children's National in Washington, D.C. She began um, interviewing children living with cancer who directed her to talk to their parents. And that body of research resulted in the good parent research. And it was this finding in the 2009 publication that was the, the only aha I needed because it re resonated so completely with why I started Courageous Parents Network and what I was trying to do. Parents of children who have died of cancer report that their sense of having been a good parent at the end of their child's life helps them to emotionally survive their experience, and their child's loss. In Courageous Parents Network world, we call it the better the before, the better the after. We believe that with the appropriate levels of support and the involvement of palliative informed, palliative minded care, parents can and will experience minimal regret. And when there is minimal regret, there can be maximal healing because the most corrosive ingredient in grief is decisional regret. Um, a little more about the good parent research. Uh, Dr. Hines asked the question um, of parents with children living with cancer, share with me your definition of being a good parent for your child at this point in your child's life, as well as describe the actions from others that would help you to be a good parent to your child now. And the findings, and there were a lot of them, really foregrounded, um, uh, you know, concluded that there were a number of things that parents said would help them um, be the best parent they can be. Their hopes are, I want to feel like I'm doing right by my child. I am there for my child and being a good advocate for my child. I'm not allowing suffering. And of course, wherever and if ever possible, I want to help my child be healthy. Uh, the doctor, um, multiple physicians, researchers have extended Dr. Hines' research from um, up there in 2009. Tracy Shaw, also at Children's National, looked at good parents' concept of what it, the good parent concept for families being cared for in the intensive care units. Um, Dr. Hill found, looked at how parents' belief change over time. Dr. Robinson did research with fathers. And then in 2021, in 2020, with the involvement and partnership with Courageous Parents Network, Dr. Megan Weaver researched how, um, uh, how to honor the good parent intentions and what, phys what medical um, clinicians, providers can do to honor good parent intentions. We're gonna look at it, that in a minute. Before we do, what gets in the way for parents, what gets in the way for parents of feeling like they can be the best possible parent they can be for their child. Um, and it's important to note, which I should have said this, there's no opposite, there's no such thing as, as the bad parent. And it's not a value judgment coming from the outside. This is a value judgment for parents from the inside. Um, so please know it's not like she's a bad parent or I'm a bad parent. It's what helps me feel like I'm being a good parent. Okay, these are the things that get in the way. 
and all of it's the invisible inner psychosocial and emotional components. First, there is that feeling of helplessness, a lack of control, and a pressure that we as parents typically feel to be in control. Um, this is a quote from the book, uh, uh, Why Religion by Elaine Pagels, whose son um, was diagnosed with a fatal condition. How could we go on living having so little control over what matters most? And that is a sentiment that we hear parents say a lot that happens to them when they're going through the, um, when they're going through uh, a, a diagnosis. Um, secondly, parents worry that their child's quality of life is currently being misunderstood or will be misunderstood. Uh, this is certainly true for parents whose children are um, uh, inpatient at the hospital. They don't know what my child is like at home. They don't see the smiles. They can't see how his lip turns up when he likes something. Um, it is understandable when you are seeing children at their worst, which is that they're sick, they're inpatient, or they're coming for a clinic visit and nobody really actually truly wants to be there. And you're not seeing them in the comfort of their home with their pets and their stuffed animals and their siblings and the stuff that they love the most. You can't possibly know what that child is like at their best. Of course, this is an invitation to ask the child what they're like at home um, or to ask the parents, um, but this is a parental fear. Parents also worry that they, the parents, will be misunderstood. Um, there's that element of mis mistrust or rather distrust. Um, if I cry, it will make me appear weak. If I advocate for my child or push back, it will alienate the team. And then um, if I behave, if I show emotion, such as anger, which is really a mask for my fear, I will be misunderstood as threatening and aggressive and it will lead to lower quality of care. Um, this is especially true for parents of color who we know have been historically disenfranchised and have historically received poor goal concordant care and symptom management. Um, parents also have a fear of failing their child. Uh, this is a picture of Sarah and Steve and their daughter, Emerson, who had Gaucher type two, which is still always fatal. It's one of the Gauchets that it's not um, treatable with enzyme replacement therapy. Um, and her father, Steve, um, said in our interview with him, we felt we had to show she had picked the right parents. So parental worries, feeling of helplessness, a pressure to be in control, worry that their child's quality of life is misunderstood, worry that they are or will be misunderstood, distrust with the medical system, fear of failing their child, and for many parents, for some, I should say, for some, this was not for me, but for some, there is a feeling of guilt. Certainly um, uh, that my genes, my, my guilt. Uh, I didn't, my husband and I never felt guilty. We didn't know we were carriers. We didn't know that this was something we were giving to our daughter, but um, these, you know, emotions are not rational and, um, and quite a number of parents will feel guilty. Um, so some other invisible burdens that parents are carrying when they come into the space or are going about their lives with their children, um, in, in addition to that of being a good parent, uh, there may very well be trauma that precedes them from the diagnostic odyssey, what happened to them before you met them. Um, it is not uncommon for parents to suspect that there is something wrong with their baby, wrong with their child. And for that suspicion to be dismissed um, as, you know, your child is just development developing slowly, or you're just an anxious parent, let's wait and see, let's wait and see, let's wait and see. Those are instincts from the primary care pediatrician and specialists that are often understandable, but at the end of the day, when something ends up that there, there really was something, um, that has not left a good taste in the parent's mouth. Um, the presence of anticipatory grief for all the things that are being lost, the future the parents were hoping for um, that will now not be. As we discussed, a fear of regret, 
um, and the burden of decisional fatigue. Um, so many decisions that parents have to make. These decisions become um, burdensome, exhausting, and ever present as part of that burden is the fear of regret. And then I talked about distrust in the medical system. So what role can you as clinicians play in fostering good parent beliefs? Luckily, there's been some research on this. Um, how can you help parents feel seen, heard, and misunderstood? Uh, Doctor, uh, we're going to get to the work of Dr. Weaver in a moment, but doctors um, Jory Bogetz and Julie Hauer. Uh, Jory Bogetz is a complex care clinician in Seattle. Julie Hauer is a palliative care doctor who specializes in children with severe neurological impairment. They partnered with a mom, Liz Morris, whose son had mitochondrial disease, for whom Dr. Bogetz was one of his doctors at Seattle Children's. And they co authored a uh, article that was published in Pediatrics in August of 22 called Asset-Based Healthcare for Children with SNI. And in that article, they talk about what parents, what help, what physicians can do to help parents center the good. They can recognize the parent as the expert in their child. They can celebrate inch stones as little wins. How often the child smiles, that's an inch stone. They can help parents see the positive outcomes of their caregiving. You and your child have not been in the hospital for months. I know you're here now, but let's acknowledge that you haven't, you've kept your child well at home for all these months. The fact that you are here now is not an indication of a failure. Rather, it's an indication of how well you've done. And now you're doing the right thing to bring your child in now for, for um, special attention. They can also focus on the hopes that parent, that family has for future, and they can help those parents live in a meaningful present while anticipating that the future may be a difficult one. I do encourage you to read that article. Uh, the research behind this or in parallel was published in um, multiple publications in 2020. Um, this is the research that Dr. Weaver and Dr. Lori Weiner and Dr. Pamela Hines and um, a parent named uh, Marie Newman and Courageous Parents Network published together. Um, we did together. Uh, 42 parents completed a survey with open-ended questions. What behaviors from medical staff foster your ability to work toward your personal definition of being a good parent. And in those green rectangular boxes, you see the primary things that physician, that clinicians can do. Acknowledge the parent's role in caring for their child, providing and practicing kind and com caring communication, truly seeing and truly seeing the child. Um, and those yellow circles provide additional detail. Now, I one of the things I think is so important about this slide is it, I don't think there's anything particularly technical or sophisticated about what's in those yellow circles. And I also suspect that all of those things are things that anyone who goes into pediatrics is inclined to do anyway. All of these things are tools you already have in your toolbox. You, this is the human being in you knows how to do this. And which I find extremely hopeful and encouraging. And I'm sure many of you are already doing this already, but just like this, this is from a parental standpoint, in addition to the technical pieces of symptom management, pain management, um, making recommendations for treatments, this is what parents remember. It's the Maya Angelou quote, you know, people will forget what you said and what you did, but they will remember how you made, made them feel. And please forgive me for how I butchered that quote, but what people remember is how you made them feel. Um, 
There is a book that I strongly, strongly recommend. It's called Shared Struggles. It's a collection of essays by physicians and parents of children um, living with medical complexity and serious illness. Uh, the so the physicians write essays, the their their physician essays, parent essays, and then each essay is followed by a reflection by the two editors. One is Dr. Markowitz from Children's of LA. The other is a mother, Anne Schruten. Um, in one of the essays, the clinician, the physician, talks about how she was really, really struggling with reconciling what the parents were hoping for with what she believed was possible. She felt like uh, the parents were hoping for something that was completely unrealistic, unlikely, and she was really, really struggling with aligning herself with those parents. Ultimately, however, she ended up there. And in that, and she did this, as Dr. Markowitz observed in his reflection, by believing in the parents. Even as the doctor did not believe in the child's recovery as the parents did, the doctor believed in the parents. And that is a really, really powerful or fabulous expression of what it means to align yourself with the parents. All right, we are gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing and John is going to uh, show this video. Um, we are gonna look at some videos from Courageous Parents Network. This mom is Crystal. Her daughter, Sydney, has severe cerebral palsy. Crystal takes care of Sydney at home. She is seen by palliative care as well as other clinicians at Children's Hospital of Atlanta. Earlier on, um, I was a bit of a, you know, you, when, when things are new to you, it, it's like going into a new job, you're nervous. You, and then you, these people have been working here and doing this longer than you. So you, you kind of feel like they, they, they have more experience than I do. They know what they're doing. Um, but that's not always true. Um, and, you know, even with doctors and nurses at the hospital, just because they went to school for it, it doesn't mean that they know what they're doing all the way around the board. So I, I was at first uh, about a week in, I was like, you know, make it, letting them, uh, you know, tell me things. And then after a week, I'm like, okay, enough is enough. Okay, you're this is my child. You're not going to come in here and talk to me like you're better than I am because you have a degree for this. I'm her mother. Okay. I'm her mother. I'm her father. I'm her doctor. I'm her nurse. I am her everything. Okay. And you can't go to school for that. So I've had a few, you know, try to talk, talk, um, at me instead of to me. And so it's like, you get to a point where you kind of get pissed off and you're like, okay, enough is enough. Now I see how I got to conduct myself and how I have to handle this situation. So that was the turning point for me. Like um, when, when you, you, you're tired of the technical terms and, and medical terms and, you know, instead of them thinking, okay, well, this person doesn't know this, these terms. So I'm going to break this thing down for them. So I, I, I got pissed off and I was like, okay, well, enough is enough. This is how we're going to do it. I tried it your way. Now you all are going to do it my way. Did you get pushback? Uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple times. But uh, we're pretty well known around Shoa now. So <laughs> uh, I don't ask for a whole lot. I'm, all I ask for is respect, you know? And if you can't give me that, we have a serious problem. So uh Everybody there knows now if we do have to go to the hospital, that's Miss House, that's Sydney House. Sweetest, they they just know like I'm I'm just sweet. They call me sunshine when I come, okay? And Sydney's the diva. So a lot of people know that when I come and when we come, it's it's nothing but love. If she goes off or says something, 
it's because someone pushed her to that point. Okay, so they go ahead and address it. And it's like they go ahead and prepare the new staff for me, you know? Yeah. I think we'll save questions um, for the end. Um, any reflections you want to make about that um, that video after? Um, I think, John, can you go to the next video? This is the same one. Um, go to the next one, please. This is a video of par the parents' pressure to do everything. Is this the correct one? It's so fraught with yes. like uh, expect that what's not being captured is like we would hope for a change and then we would we'd plan and we'd work so hard on it, whether it was OT, PT, speech, and then it wouldn't happen and the devastation you feel. And at some point, you, whether it's acceptance or whether it's resignation, I don't know, but it just, do you stop trying? I, it's not, you stop trying because you're still doing all the care and you're still trying to do all the supports, but I guess there's a, a realization that you may not achieve that. And while there is a huge letdown and, and um, it can be demoralizing to have that realization, there's also a freeing and a sense of maybe it's not so critical that we push everything and maybe we are able to set a little bit less stressful priorities. Um, I remember when Katie was little and, you know, EI would come and the OT would work with her and say, now I want you to do just these two things, this and this, and tell me how it goes next week. And I go, oh, okay, you know, and, and the teacher would come and say, make sure you try doing this, um, during feeding. Oh, okay. And then, um, who else, S speech or somebody would say, and give another little homework. And, and each one was very reasonable. But by the end of the week, I had 12 things I needed to try in addition to giving her, you know, 14 medications four times a day and remembering the timing of which one goes where. And it's like, it became absolutely overwhelming. And um, yet I felt like I had to do every one of those things to be a good parent. And eventually you realize you just actually can't. I mean, maybe some, some women and families can, but I couldn't. And so I had to kind of start taking that information in, not disregarding it, but using it to figure out what my priorities are for Katie and what, you know, my partner's priorities were for Katie and work, put the most attention to those. Even if that meant that some days I had to say, we didn't try that this week or no, I didn't get to that. I love how she um, names every specialist who, like the OT, the the PT, like they are, they're just focused on their piece of the pie and mom, do this, mom, do that. And then mom's like, great. But at the end of the day, you have that many specialists working, coaching you on things to do. It's just it can become too much. And just having that perspective of the universe or ecosystem um, can be really, really, is really, is important to have and very helpful. Um, uh, and I think we are gonna go, the next one is um, of a different nature. We're gonna show that too, please. This, this is a mom of a son with SMA. Initially, when I thought of a trach, when they talked to me about the trach, you know, they said, you know, in the in the future, you would have to, you know, decide whether or not to trach your child. And, and I'm thinking, no, after seeing that little girl and the thought of the way I thought of it at that point was cutting a hole in my son's throat. No, there's no, there's no way. And when he was 11 months old, he kept getting sick. He was on the BiPAP and we kept ending up back in the hospital. And the, in February, um, which wasn't that long later, they said they tried to extubate him, you know, take him off the vent, and they were unsuccessful. And they said, um, you have to make a decision. Are we going to let him go and do comfort care, or do you want to trach him and put him on a vent? So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to answer that question because my no from before was no longer on the table because losing my son, letting him go, 
I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. Um, so they were both bad choices. So I, um, I thank God I had my faith because I, I prayed every night for five days. I said, God, you have to make this decision. I cannot make this decision. Um, my husband at the time, Alex's dad said, whatever you decide, I will support you, which is nice in a way, but also not terribly helpful. Um, so I prayed, I said, God, you have to make this decision. I don't want to let him go. But what I really want is what's best for him. And I don't know what that is. So, and every night that I said those words, I heard in my head, get the trach. And I just figured that's just my unconscious mind telling me what I want to hear. So it was five days. And I remember the fifth night, it was more like, get the trach. And so then I was like, <laughs> I'm standing there. I sat walking around the hospital and every, every once in a while I ask someone, like a nurse or someone, I'm like, does your subconscious mind yell at you? And most people said no. One person I remember said yes. And I'm like, I really don't think your subconscious mind yells at you. I think God just yelled at me because I'm not listening. He's saying the same thing over and over, get the trait, get the trait, get the trait. And I'm just going, that's just me because I don't want to let him go. So after I got yelled at, I went back and I told the nurses, I'm ready for the pack team, sat down with them and I said, we're going to get the trach. So we did. And afterwards I was so grateful that we had gotten the trach because Alex had been so weak and he was always struggling and, you know, the breathing was just hard. And after he was put on the vent, he was so much stronger in so many other ways because he didn't have to struggle to breathe so much. And I remember a few, a few years ago, because we were living in this house, um, so Zoe had already been born. So it may have been five years ago, six years ago. I was walking through Alex's room and he had been sick for a while. And I remember thinking to myself, I didn't say anything. I, he didn't have a nurse that day, I was his nurse. And I was walking through his room thinking, did I really do what was best for him? And I immediately heard the voice say, you didn't make that decision. And so I immediately looked up and said, that's right, I didn't. So I didn't have that guilt that, you know, did I do what, it's so hard to make life and death decisions for your child. So I think that certainly captures the, uh, in a very um, uh, extreme way, not extreme, but a, sorry, I'm trying to advance, uh, the inner monologue of parents, the inner landscape. And that mother was making an extraordinarily large decision for her son, which is the lifelong decision of um, mechanical ventilation with a trach. And ultimately, as you heard, she believes and finds tremendous comfort in the fact that she shared that decision with God or actually that it was God's decision. And um, I share that with you because it is exemplary of, it is an example, not, it is an example of the invisible things uh, the, that we can't see that are happening, that may be happening inside parents' minds as they try to figure this out. Um, and certainly they rely on clear communication with you and the rest of their child's team to inform the decision-making. But at the end of the day, for them, it's going to be how does my what does my love look like in this moment for my child? What is the right loving thing to do for my child? And for this mom, it was to get the, her son a trach. Her, that's what God told her. For the other mother, she had to make peace with not doing all the things that she was told to do. And with um, Crystal, it's about being, you know, her child's advocate in all ways. Um, well, that's true for all parents. Um, okay, so uh, 
now we get to create those videos are part of Courageous Parents Network. We are a 24, we are a national nonprofit. We have a digital platform as well as live programming and presentations like this. Our digital platform features over has over 600 professionally produced videos like the ones you just saw of parents talking about a range of topics from diagnosis through end of life, including around medical decision-making. At our core, we are by parents for parents to reduce the isolation that parents feel, to help them hear from parents like them, to help them consider what they want for their child after hearing what other parents have decided or how it validates the parental experience. It validates the range of emotions. Um, we are decision agnostic. So for every video that you see of a parent who chose a trach or a feeding tube or spinal fusion surgery, we feature parents who opted not to do that for their child. So we are decision agnostic. We are disease agnostic. We don't talk about symptoms or treatment management, but we do shamelessly and aggressively and consistently promote the value, value of palliative care, whether it's palliative care as a specialty or simply palliative informed care so that parents ask for it or if they're referred, they understand what it is and so that more clinicians will refer palliative care. Um, families to palliative care and develop in their own toolbox palliative skills. Um, here's a handful of the topics. These are the top types of topics we cover um, where there are parents um, and clinicians talking about these issues. Um, those issues include, as you can see, anticipatory grief, palliative care, shared decision-making, spirituality, the marriage or partnership, Tending to the siblings. Siblings is a very, very big topic. As you might imagine, we have a lot of content of parents talking about how they support the siblings. We have a few videos from siblings, and we also have child life specialists and pediatric psychologists talking about how they support families when there are siblings involved, including supporting siblings um, as at end of life and into bereavement. Uh, we this is a snapshot of the over 40 plus families that we've interviewed specifically for Courageous Parents Network. Um, you can see some snapshot of them. And as I said, we also feature uh, physicians, social workers, nurses, chaplains, genetic counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, who talk about how they scaffold the experience for families. All of this, these, um, clinicians that we interview are palliative minded. Not all of them are palliative um, care specialists, but they are all palliative minded specialists. Uh, I include this uh, blog, uh, this excerpt from a blog from a mother, um, CPN has a big robust blog um, written. All the blogs are, we curate and edit the blogs, but they are written by parents. Um, in the network. And this mom, Deborah, her daughter, Cassie, had been living for, I think she's about 12 at the time, um, was being, um, had lots and lots of medical interventions. In this moment, the medical intervention they are considering is whether she should have spinal fusion surgery and rods. And um, uh, the mom has is describing a meeting where they're having to decide this. And present at that meeting is a palliative care um, social worker who asked in the meeting, how do you think Cassie feels about being here and all the interventions that she is experiencing? With this one exact statement, I began to question what being a good parent was truly about. I answered, I think she absolutely hates being here and all the invasiveness that she is experiencing. And it was then that I heard it was okay to say no and that it would be coming from a loving place because it isn't always the case that the best thing to be done is the intervention. Sometimes doing something means doing nothing. Um, and uh, we live in an age of fix and manage and fix and manage and do and do. And often that can be what the parents want and sometimes with enough communication and effective, um, you know, 
a shared the shared enterprise between parents and clinicians it can be that doing something the choice to do nothing is actually doing something and really giving parents the agency to make that decision um, courageous parents network has a ton of guides to support families and clinicians um, the picture on the right is shows you some of those guides and one of them is a new guide on um, shared decision making that we produced with Dr. Kate Nelson at Sick Kids for Children in um, the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto. Um, we also have a clinician portal. I hope you will all join CPN. I'll show you that in a moment in the last slide. Join CPN when you join, which takes about 30 seconds. You will have access, identify yourself as a clinician, um, which will automatically give you access to the portal. Uh, all of the content in the portal has been written by a uh, physicians or nurse practitioner for fellow clinicians um, with scripts about how to do advanced care planning with families, how to do um, and to, uh, to support them in bereavement, how to talk to the siblings, how to deliver bad news. We recognize none of this is CME professional development and that you get credit for, but it's just here 24 seven, download the guide, watch some videos, hear from families. And there's just so much in here that can help clinicians. It's here to help clinicians feel better equipped and prepared to um, support families in their care. Um, okay, in closing, I'm gonna show you, this is a photo of Cameron at her second birthday. It's a few, a few hours later than the one I showed you at the beginning when we're sitting on the floor. Um, I'm giving her her big, beautiful birthday cake. There are probably 80 people that you can't see singing and dancing and celebrating her two years. I am a very grateful, hopeful parent even as I know that shortly, I don't know it's four days from now, but shortly my daughter will die. And I, this is a quote that somebody gave, this is a poem that somebody gave me a few weeks after she died. It's the poem Late Fragment by Raymond Carver. And when it was given to me, I burst into tears because it captured for me exactly what mattered most. And it's sort of basically the good parent poem, I would say. Um, and I always try to end on this. Did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. I like to think that that is what my daughter Cameron wanted. I believe that is what my daughter Cameron wanted. And I know that that is what her father and I, with the help of friends, family, and a palliative minded physician, we were able to deliver. All right. Uh, if you would take a picture of this slide, you can see the URL where to sign up. The QR code will take you directly to it. We have an app. You can use all, CPN has an app. You can access all of our stuff on the app. And I also welcome your emails. Um, so please, please, if you sign up, you will get two emails a month from us. Um, we keep them short, just hyperlinks to all the new content. Um, we have a very exciting new um, resource coming out for families, of children, for families and clinicians caring for children with severe neurological impairment. We're um, releasing that next week. Uh, if you sign up, you'll be able to uh, stay tuned, stay abreast of it. And I promise you, uh, the stuff we share is designed to be valuable. It's professionally produced, and it is, we believe, worth your time. I would love questions. We only have three minutes. I can stay after, but I suspect a lot of you can't. I'm sorry, I didn't leave more time for questions. Um, Blythe, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I think there are so many tangible things in there that we can do at the bedside, 
um, all of us um, and just the resource you've built. I've watched it build up over the last years. Um, it's just amazing. Um, questions here in the room. I know we're short on time, but does anyone have questions for Blythe they'd like to ask? Um, happy to take those. What yes. would be the one thing she would hope that the residents would take away from this actually young position? Okay. So Blythe, um, what would the question is, um, what would be the one thing you would hope young physicians would take away from this um this talk today, this morning? I think it would be the idea that you there is always I believe it is always possible and you may need to get additional support from people more experienced who can help you. And eventually that will be you for somebody else to align yourself with parents and that to, to find a place where the, to align yourself with parents and what their wishes are and to help them um, help them be the parents that they want to be, care for their child in the ways that matter most to them. Um, that even when you are um, wanting parents to do something or make a decision that you think is that you think is in the best interest of the child's health, and they're not there yet, to wait, to use communication, to build trust, to use time as your ally, to bring in others as needed, if needed, to build that trust but really to foreground the parent as the expert in their child and to build that therapeutic relationship to enable the, the, that, the, the decision-making that both works. And I understand that sometimes there's no time for that, but typically there is. Um, and then there's much more around it, but I think it's always possible to align yourself with parents and it's certainly worth trying. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Blythe, so much. Um, we really appreciate you and your time. Thank you. Please, please come on. Come on. Join CPN. It's free. It's 24-7. And then you'll find out about NeuroJourney. And you'll be like, oh, it's, it's good stuff. And I hope I get to come there sometime and meet some of you in person. Thank you. Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs>